the San Francisco Giants and their fans probably thought that 2002 had to be their year. It was just their second appearance in the World Series in the past 40 seasons, and they had the greatest hitter of all time in their lineup at the absolute peak of his powers at age 37, but that was probably totally normal and not at all worth looking into. They also had another former MVP in second baseman Jeff Kent, lights out closer in Rob Ninn, and a terrific manager in Dusty Baker. It seemed like it was all coming together at the right time, but with a core that was already old and getting older, it kind of had to be the right time, if there was ever going to be a right time at all. And it might have been, had they not run into another really good team in the Anaheim Angels. No, Los Angeles yet, just, just the Anaheim. The Giants took a 3-2 lead back to Southern California, but were beaten in both of the final two games of the series, losing their shot at the World Series, and subsequently losing both Baker and Kent in the offseason. Bonds continued to rake, and the team continued to contend for a couple more years, but after 2004, both he and the Giants regressed significantly. It was time for a full-on rebuild, and even though they were now a long way from the heights they reached in 2002, there were better days on the horizon than even the most optimistic of Giants fans could have possibly hoped for. As a team that has historically had some money, but not as much as a lot of other clubs, the Giants couldn't afford to just throw a bunch of cash at any free agent they wanted. To build a team that would contend consistently, they'd have to do it through the draft, which is exactly what they did, eventually. Like a lot of teams have done over the years, the Giants had sacrificed a couple of years' worth of high draft picks to sign free agents, which meant that for the 2005 draft, the first year post-bonds and prime rebuild time, the team wouldn't have a pick until the fourth round. Not ideal for a team that's trying to accumulate talent, but they made the most of it through guys like reliever Sergio Romo, who they got in the 28th round that year. And when they did get a first-round pick in 2006, they used it wisely, taking future two-time Cy Young winner Tim Lincecum out of Washington, 10th overall. Madison Bumgarner went 10th overall in 2007, and in 2008, they got the best of the bunch, drafting top catcher prospect Buster Posey out of Florida State with the 5th overall pick. It took them 4 years to accumulate, but by 2008, the Giants had drafted a core of exciting young players on both sides of the diamond, as well as some role players who would be absolutely crucial pieces in their future playoff runs. Speaking of which, the 2009 Giants very nearly made the playoffs, and would have had the Rockies not set their franchise record for wins that year. Matt Cain and Tim Lincecum, both of whom the Giants drafted, made the All-Star team, and Lincecum, who was still just 25 years old at the time, won his second consecutive Cy Young Award. 22-year-old Pablo Sandoval, who the Giants signed all the way back in 2002 out of Venezuela, led the team in home runs, and with Buster Posey, now one of the top prospects in all of baseball, and Madison Bumgarner both debuting that year, the Giants' rebuild looked like it was going pretty well. The team was good way sooner than a lot of people expected, but unlike in 2002, the stars of this version of the Giants were young and hungry, and as the next season would prove, ready to win big. The main thing you need to know about the 2010 Giants, and really about the Giants in this era in general, is that these guys could pitch. First in the league in Team ERA, first in the league in hits, first in the league in whip, and top three or top five in a whole bunch of other categories. The offense wasn't spectacular, but with a pitching staff like this one, all the way from starters like Lindsey Cummy Kane down to closer Brian Wilson, they didn't have to be. The Giants didn't even mess around with the whole playoff thing in 2010, just outright winning the division by two games over the Padres. This is off topic, but for a while there, the NL West was just kind of a revolving door as far as who was going to the playoffs or going to win the division, and that was super fun. In the five-year span between 2006 and 2010, all five teams made the playoffs and provided some of the best baseball moments of the past 20 years or so along the way. Where was I? Oh, right. The Giants are good now. The Giants beat the Braves in the NLDS in four games to set up a showdown with the two-time defending NL champion Phillies, who were heavily favored to make it to their third World Series in a row. But as you will probably notice, became a bit of a theme for these guys, the Giants did not care about any of that. Game one of that series was about as good a pitching matchup as anyone could have hoped for in 2010. The Giants' Tim Lincecum against the Phillies' Roy Halladay. Now, Lincecum had won the Cy Young in both of the previous seasons, so he was obviously no slouch. But Halladay was pitching at home, and in his previous start, well, let's just say it didn't go super well for the Reds. Ruiz, in time! Roy Halladay has thrown a no-hitter! It appeared that the 33-year-old Halliday had the advantage going into Game 1, but the Giants weren't having any of it. Cody Ross hit a home run in the third and the fifth off of Halliday, and all in all, San Francisco scored four runs off of the guy who was about to be named the NL Cy Young winner. The offense was doing just enough to keep the Giants in games, and as their formula dictated, that was all the arms needed to beat the Phillies. Lincecum and company held one of the league's most powerful offenses to just 20 runs in a six-game series. 
who propelled the Giants to their first World Series since that Bonds team in 2002. And that series would become pretty emblematic of how the Giants would do their business over the entirety of this incredible run. The offense finally got going in their World Series against the Rangers, but what really sticks out from those box scores is how little the Rangers could generate when they were at the plate. The Texas lineup, which featured AL MVP Josh Hamilton and was just about as dominant as the Phillies, got shut out twice in the five-game series and were made to look like an absolute shell of themselves. A 2-4-7 team ERA throughout that postseason guided the Giants to their first championship in San Francisco and their first championship period in 56 years. Just like that, the Giants' formula for winning the World Series had been created. Dominant pitching, not giving a crap who they were up against in any playoff series whatsoever, and hitting so clutch that it bordered on being supernatural. They missed the playoffs in 2011, which gave some ammo to the people who thought that the year before was just a fluke, but you could chalk a lot of that up to a brutal injury to their star young catcher, on a play that definitely wouldn't have any ramifications on the game going forward. But they were right back in the mix in 2012, winning the NL West in dominant fashion and getting a matchup with their former manager Dusty Baker in the Cincinnati Reds in the NLDS, in which they immediately lost both of the opening games at home by a combined score of 14 to two. That's gotta be the end, right? Down two to nothing with all of your road games left to play against a team with 97 wins? Who turns that around? Well, these Giants do. Down 3-1 to the Cardinals in the NLCS? That's not a problem either. The Giants gave up one run in their last three games against St. Louis to advance to the World Series, which, after those two rounds, was an absolute cakewalk. If the first two rings established and then reinforced the formula for how this team could win, then what happened in 2014 took that formula and cranked it up to 11. After the 2013 season saw them win just 76 games and finish 16 games back of the Dodgers, the Giants had the hardest possible road ahead of them to try and make it back to the World Series, starting with a wild card game against the Pirates. That was fine though. Madison Bumgarner threw a complete game, four hit shutout. Dominant pitching, check. The next series was the NLDS against an absolutely loaded Washington Nationals team. 96 wins, Steven Strasburg, Bryce Harper, didn't even matter a little bit. The Giants only gave up nine runs in four games and took the series before the Nats even knew what hit them. Not caring who was in front of them, check. Adam Wainwright and the Cardinals were next, but they would fall victim to the last piece of the Giants championship puzzle. An extremely clutch hit from Travis Ishikawa in game five. Hits one into right. The Giants win the pennant. The Royals gave the Giants everything they wanted and more in the World Series, but it still wasn't enough. In their first series that actually went to an elimination game, one of the arms that the Giants drafted in that long rebuild absolutely carried them to glory, becoming a legend for the club and just baseball in general in the process. So that's the what, how, and why of the Giants unexpectedly winning three World Series in five years. But for the purposes of this video, what I really want to talk about is the legacy these guys leave behind. Here's a list from Bleacher Report in 2015, entitled 15 Legitimate Sports Dynasties. Most of the heavy hitters you'd expect are here. 90s Bulls, Tom Brady Patriots, Derek Jeter Yankees, yada yada yada. But no Giants. Here's a Yard Barker article in 2021 about the top 25 sports dynasties of all time. The 2010's Giants are number 23. They also called them the least intimidating of any of the teams on the list, which is probably true, but kinda seems like an unnecessary qualifier for a list like this. Yahoo Sports did a similar list in 2020, and guess what? The 2010's Giants weren't on it. And just to reiterate, this team won three World Series in five years, the first team to pull that off since the 90s Yankees. This is not a thing that happens all that often in modern day baseball, so what gives? It's pretty much impossible to pinpoint exactly what might be causing people to overlook this Giants team, but I think there are a few possible explanations. The first is that, on paper, this didn't appear to be a team that had a whole lot of superstars, especially in their lineup. The Giants had really good players, of course, but they were also helped out in some pretty crucial moments by what I can only describe as a bunch of randos. For example, in 2010, the first year that they won the World Series, their team leader in war was Aubrey Huff with 5.7, the best season of his career by that metric. And if you knew that answer, you're either a member of Aubrey Huff's family, a diehard Giants fan, or you're just lying. The MVP of that World Series was 35-year-old Edgar Renteria, a very good player, but not the kind of guy you'd expect to be a linchpin of a championship run. Over the entire five-year stretch, they never had a guy hit more than 27 home runs. 
only had one player get over 100 RBIs in a season, and just never had the kind of David Ortiz, Albert Pujol-style hitter that you might expect from a championship team. This was a group that stretched the old axiom about pitching and defense winning championships to the absolute max, and that's just not very sexy, you know? And while the Giants had a lot of very good players, as well as some less good ones who suddenly became very good when the playoffs started, they didn't have that one guy who was the center of their universe for the entirety of that run. They also weren't that dominant, at least in the regular season, never winning more than 94 games and never having home field advantage all the way through the playoffs. They were also kinda rough in the years between their championship runs, missing the playoffs in both 2011 and 2013 for one reason or another. They play out on the West Coast. They benefited from a few high-profile mistakes from their opponents in crucial situations that led to them being called lucky. All of these things contributed to the idea that even though they won all those World Series, the 2010 Giants weren't actually all that good. But while you can kind of see the logic and how people get there, if you look a couple layers deeper, that perception starts to unravel pretty quickly. From 2008 to 2015, so starting a couple years before they actually started winning things, the Giants had guys that they drafted win multiple Cy Youngs, an MVP, throw a perfect game, multiple no-hitters, and just a bunch of guys making all-star teams and leading the league in individual categories. No, they didn't have Mike Trout on their team, but they had an absolute army of good pitchers and a lineup of guys who could get on base and drive in runs when they needed to. It was kind of crazy how many times they managed to get exactly what they needed, exactly when they needed it. But that didn't make them lucky, it made them good. And a not insignificant portion of the credit for that kind of thing has to go to manager Bruce Bochy. He's pretty emblematic of this whole team's attitude. A guy who was actually under 500 as a manager for his career, at least until he leads the Texas Rangers to glory, presumably, but is somehow responsible for more than half of the Padres' playoff appearances in the entire history of their franchise, and guided the Giants through their rebuild all the way to the promised land. And for all the talk of them not being dominant, the Giants only played in four elimination games across three different playoff runs. So yeah, you can say what you want about the Giants not being a traditional dynasty in the sense that they never won in back-to-back -back seasons and that their performance dropped off in the years that they didn't win a title. You could also knock them for never having a dominant power hitter or a 100-win season or a zip code that's not east in the Mississippi. But you shouldn't. Just look at the teams they beat in the World Series. The Tigers and Rangers were exactly the kinds of teams that you would expect to win multiple titles, full of superstars on both sides of the diamond. And yet, it wasn't enough to beat the Giants Contrast that with the Royals, who were pretty much their mirror image in 2014, but they couldn't figure the Giants out either. The 2010's Giants were weird, I'll grant you, and it seems pretty unlikely they will ever see a team like them again, but they deserve more credit than history seems to want to give them. Swiss psychologist Carl Jung was known in part for his theory on what he called the collective unconscious, which is the idea that we carry over and share ideas from different times and cultures to form what are known as archetypes. And the 2010's Giants did not fit the archetype of what we would traditionally think of as a dynasty, but we shouldn't hold that against them. In fact, I think they should be celebrated even more for what they accomplished in spite of that, because like I said earlier, it's not very likely that we'll ever see a team that looks or plays like them have so much sustained success again. And it wasn't by accident either. The Giants drafted and signed and set their team up to do exactly what it ended up doing, even if it didn't make much sense in the context of modern baseball. Maybe that's why it works so well. The Giants don't have to be your favorite dynasty ever, or even one of them, but they do deserve to be counted as one of the greatest of all time. Especially when you consider where they came from, how they did it, and how impossible it seems for anyone to replicate it in the future, it becomes pretty clear that this team was special. They were scrappy and scruffy and didn't really look the part, but they got the job done better than just about anyone could ever hope to. And for that, they really were Giants. Hello everyone, and thank you for tuning into today's video. This is what we refer to on this channel as a team building exercise, where we look at the formation of some of the best and most interesting squads sports have to offer, and we have a few of them all ready to go if you enjoyed this one. I did not especially enjoy watching the 2010's Giants at the time, especially when they were beating my Braves in the NLDS, but I did very much enjoy researching how they came to be for this video. I love a good weird team, and the Giants were a very weird team, but a fun one to think about in hindsight. Our next video will be about a weird player from another sport who no one seems to be able to stop, but until then, that's all we have for you. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you back here again soon. Bye!